Today I want to do a very important Bible study on a very important question, and that question is, how can I be sure of my salvation? Uh, this is such an important question, and uh, in light of all that's been going on recently with some of the videos that have gone viral, over a million views and counting in the last week just on uh, two videos in particular, one of which is in excess of uh, 750,000 views in a, in a week's time. And as you can imagine, there are hundreds and hundreds of people that are responding to these, and many of them, I would say, the most common question is concerns about whether they're right with God. Am I really saved? I, I've always struggled with this. I don't have an assurance of my salvation. Is it possible to really know? And so with the help of the Lord, let's open our Bibles, and I'm going to do my very best to walk you through the Scriptures today and to eliminate every doubt and every concern. And I promise you, and it's not my promise to give, it's a Bible promise that I simply convey. But I promise you, because the Bible promises you, that you can have a full assurance of knowing that your heart is right with God, knowing that all of your sins are forgiven and that you'd be ready to meet the Lord either by means of rapture or at the end of life. You can have that faith and have that assurance. It is well with my soul. Let's go into 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, tucked all the way in the back of your New Testament the last book is Revelation, the book before that is Jude, and then we have three letters from the Apostle John. 1 John and the fifth chapter, and let's go down to verse 11. And this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. Pause right there. John the Apostle, in writing this particular letter, he addresses Christians. Notice that he said, I have written this to you who believe. He's writing this to Christians and to believers. And then he goes on to say, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Even all the way back in the first century and even today in the 21st century, there are many people, even believers, who struggle and have doubts and worry, wondering if they're really right with God. And as John addressed this, we're going to address it as well. Go to verse 14, and we are confident that He hears us whenever we ask for anything that pleases Him. And since we know He hears us when we make our requests, we also know that He will give us what we ask for. If you see a Christian brother or sister sinning in a way that does not lead to death, you should pray, and God will give that person life. But there is a sin that leads to death, and I am not saying you should pray for those who commit it. All wicked actions are sin, but not every sin leads to death. We know that God's children do not make a practice of sinning, for God's Son holds them securely, and the evil one cannot touch them. We know that we are children of God, and that the world around us is under the control of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come, and He has given us understanding so that we can know the true God. And now we live in fellowship with the true God because we live in fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the only true God, and He is eternal life. 
Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your hearts. Let's take a moment to pray as we begin this Bible study today. Heavenly Father, thank you for another day. Thank you for life and health and strength. Everything that we have comes from your gracious hand, and we give you praise. Thank you for the Word of God. Thank you that we have a Bible translated in our language that we can read and study and understand and teach and share when there are many in the world who do not even have a copy of the Bible available in their language. And so today we thank you for your eternal word. And we humble our hearts in your holy presence. And we ask that by the great wisdom and knowledge of the Holy Spirit, that you'll guide our every thought, our every word. And I pray that you'll help people to learn. I pray that you'll help people to be changed. I pray specifically that you would drive away those who battle with doubts and concerns about the assurance of their salvation. And I pray that prayer except for those who have never received Christ, for they should have a concern about eternity and heaven and hell and what happens to them after they die. My prayer for them today is that through the Word of God they'll feel your compassion and they'll feel your drawing, and that today would be their day to turn their back on sin and turn their heart to Jesus. And as we offer that prayer at the end of this time together, give them the faith and the courage and the humility to do what they ought to do, to receive Christ is our prayer. And not only for them, but for their entire families, every son, every daughter, every grandchild, May every member of their household and all who are listening come to know Christ before it is eternally too late. And we ask these things in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Those of you who follow our ministry know that in recent days and in recent weeks there has been an unprecedented growth of people who are discovering our Bible studies and our teachings and our ministry on social media. And as a result, we are seeing an unprecedented number of people who are praying that sinner's prayer and by faith receiving him. But it doesn't stop people from having concerns and questions and doubts. And actually, one of my staff here at Lost Lamb Association said, if the Lord leads you, we are getting email after email after email after email almost on a daily basis of people asking the question about the assurance of their salvation. And though I have taught on this in various subjects that we've already covered, I wanted to take the time to bring us into a laser-focused Bible study on how you can have the assurance of your salvation. There will be more teaching that will be addressing this. Uh, if you have not already subscribed to our various social media platforms uh, and you're looking for more teaching, I've had several who have written me who have said, I don't have a home church or I'm trying to find a church near my home and many of them are not preaching the Bible or as one lady recently wrote me and said, I attended a church and the pastor got up on the first Sunday I was there and explained why certain parts of the Bible are not true and they're not for today and healing isn't for today and miracles are not for today and the book of Matthew was not for us, it was just for the Jews. And she asked my advice, I said, get out of there and find another church as I always encourage people. Once you become a real Christian, you need to find a Bible-believing church with a godly pastor. But if you're in that process and you cannot or have not yet found such a place, she asked me, as I'm searching, is it wrong for me to consider you as a pastor? I said, well, I'm not a pastor. I'm an evangelist. I don't have a church. I travel 
full time and do Law Slam events all over the world. But if you are in the process of looking for a church and have not yet found it, then yes, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, subscribe to our podcast channel, uh, subscribe to our Facebook channel. Uh, we also are on Instagram, Twitter, everything we do on social media. I have no interest in quote unquote building a bigger following. I could care less about that. I have no ego in this, and I think I can say that with clean hands and a pure heart. But do I care about reaching more people with the truth of the Bible and helping more people who are trying to find truth in the Bible? Well, in that case, I pray that God will send millions our way, and it uh, is actually happening in reality as I speak. Uh, the purpose, and I want to, if you're taking notes, I want to give you the purpose of this study together right up front. And so if you're taking notes, the purpose of our study today is number one, to help you know that you are genuinely saved. And then the second part of that is that it is the purpose of this study to remove all of the doubts that apparently so many of you are wrestling with. And so that's going to be our laser focus today. I'm not going to uh, take many left or right turns in this process, but I want you to know that you're saved, and I'm going to explain that very carefully. And not only do I want you to know that you're saved, I want to be able to address your doubts and concerns so that you never wrestle with those ever again. I'm going to ask you to remember the weight and the importance of this Bible study. How can I be sure of my salvation? Uh, many of you are going to need to share it with fellow Christians or fellow family members or people in your life who may be wrestling with the same. But I'm going to ask you to remember this study and return to it frequently. Listen to it again and again and again until you're fully immersed in the depth of what the scriptures have to say and your doubts are buried beneath the Bible. And that is the ultimate purpose of our study today, to bury every doubt beneath the Bible. Years ago, I heard Dr. Billy Graham, many of you know my great love for Dr. Billy Graham. I don't believe there'll ever be another one like him. Oh, to God that we had a hundred or a thousand Billy Grahams in the world today. But I remember years ago listening to Dr. Billy Graham tell a humorous story about the famous Dr. Albert Einstein. And uh, many of you know that Albert Einstein was a, a famous German-born physicist. Uh, I believe he actually was the one who developed the theory of relativity, and many people, though he was well-known and German-born, were not aware of the fact that most of his study and research was done here in the United States, and in particular at Princeton University, which is located in the glorious state of New Jersey. But at the time, Dr. Albert Einstein was doing research in physics in the Department of Physics at Princeton University. Uh, he lectured there, and of course some of you that are younger are going to have to go on Google and Wikipedia because his work at Princeton dates all the way back to 1921. And, uh, but he taught there, and not as a professor, and uh, this is a mistake that I've heard through the years. Many people associate Albert Einstein and say he was a professor at Princeton University in New Jersey, and while he was a professor, he discovered the theory of relativity. Well, that would not be accurate. He was never a professor at Princeton. He was never on faculty at Princeton, but uh, he did have an office there and did research there, and he did do lectures there. But here's the humorous story. Because he uh, resided there near the college at Princeton, he oftentimes, back then, uh, train travel was much more common. And uh, he took the train from Princeton in his travels on a regular basis. One day when he was on the train and traveling from Princeton, 
uh, as the conductor was going down the aisle of the train and punching the tickets of all of the passengers, he finally arrived at Dr. Albert Einstein's seat, and Dr. Uh, Einstein was looking for his ticket and couldn't find it. Uh, the story goes that he was looking in his vest pockets and couldn't find it. He looked in all of his other pockets and couldn't find it. He opened his briefcase and couldn't find it. And finally, the conductor, knowing who Dr. Albert Einstein was, he said, Dr. Einstein, he said, don't fret about it. Don't worry about it. He said, you ride the train all the time, and I'm certain that you have a ticket. And the conductor uh, went on, and Dr. Einstein continued to look and was obviously bothered by it. And some mo moments later, as the conductor was going through the same car, he found Dr. Einstein on his hands and knees uh, trying to crawl underneath the seats looking to see if his ticket was there. And so the young conductor came up to Einstein and he said, Dr. Einstein, he said, please, don't bother yourself. I know who you are and I know that you have a ticket. Einstein at that point looked up at him and carefully said, he said, you're right. I too know who I am, but I don't know where I'm going. And that was the problem that day. Einstein had a ticket to be on the train, but he had forgotten his destination, and he knew who he was, but he didn't know where he was going. And I think the truth be known that there are probably many of you who are listening to me who can relate to that story and relate to Dr. Albert Einstein's problem that day and his frustration. Uh, you know who you are, but if you'd be honest with yourself and honest with God, you really don't know where you're going and especially when it comes to eternity. What happens after we die? We all have an expiration date. You've heard me say it. We are not a carton of milk. There is no tattoo anywhere on your body with a pre-planned expiration date. And not everybody dies when they're elderly. People die all the way from birth until late ages. But we have no promise of tomorrow nor the next breath. Now, if you're a believer, you have a right to stand upon the Scripture. The Bible said in the Psalms, With long life I will satisfy thee. And I pray that over my life on a regular basis. So let's discuss this very important subject. How can I have the assurance of my salvation? Because I want you to know not only who you are, I want you to know where you're going. If you're taking notes, number one, can you really have the assurance of salvation? Can you really have the assurance of salvation? That's an important question because I've had people who are uh, older than I am spiritually, have served the Lord longer than I have, ministers that have said to me, well, you know, we just have to accept some things by faith and believe God and do the best that we can. Well, that's not true when it comes to salvation. God never intended for you to go through your entire life with concerns and anxieties and worries about life after death, about salvation, about where you'll spend eternity, about heaven, and about hell. And so it's a very important question. Can I have the assurance of my salvation? The Bible clearly teaches. There is absolutely no debate on this for anyone who believes the Bible in its entirety. The Bible clearly teaches that there is life after death, that there is eternity, that there is a heaven, and that there is a hell. And you need to know exactly what your plans are because heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people. And some of you have never given real scholarly attention to the thought of life after death. Maybe you don't even believe the Bible. Many of you that watch and some that write on a regular basis, you openly admit to me, I'm agnostic or I'm atheist or I just stumbled upon you or I've been listening but I don't know that I could say I really have any faith in the Bible. Well, I get it. 
And I'm not going to judge you for that, but I am going to ask you a question. Regardless of your position, let me ask you a sobering question that has nothing to do with faith or God or the Bible or religion or religiosity or denominationalism. Regardless of your view, let me ask you a sobering question. What happens five seconds after you die? Regardless of faith or no faith, what happens five seconds after you die? And some of you have never given serious thought to that. The Bible offers us not only the hope of the forgiveness of all of our sins and the opportunity for salvation, but the Bible offers us an assurance, not just a hope, not just a baseless faith, but the Bible offers us an assurance of knowing forgiveness of sins and having peace with God. And you will never have peace in life until you have peace with God. Because God is the creator of all humanity. Genesis 1, 26 and 27 tells us that we were all created in the image of God. It's one of the theories in the debate and the apologetic stages of explaining God and Christianity in the Bible. If there is a creation, there has to be a creator. That's not just Bible, that's fundamental science. If there is something that is created, there has to be a creator. And the Bible's answer to that in Genesis 1, 26 and 27 is that the human race was created in the image of God. And because we were created in the image of God, there is a place inside the human heart that only right relationship with God can fill. You will never be able to fill that void in your life with anything in this world. There is something inside the human heart that only right relationship with God can fill. And so can I humbly and kindly ask you to give a listen today? As I so often say, I would like to be a trusted source in teaching the Bible. And as we often do, teach and focus upon Bible prophecy. Do you know where you're going? Albert Einstein knew who he was, but his problem was he didn't know where he was going. He needed his ticket because he needed to be reminded of his destination. What's your destination? Wouldn't you like to know where you're going five seconds after you die? You know, multiple times in my decades of ministry in over 50 nations of the world, I have had the privilege and the opportunity to speak with medical professionals and uh, people that are doctors, people that are nurses, people that have been in various capacities serving in the health field. And you know what I've heard many, many times from these people in the health field? Many of them have come to faith in God, not because of an apologetic, systematic study of the authenticity of the Bible and its history. Many in the medical world have told me, eye to eye, face to face, many of them through the years at the altars when we've prayed as we do at the end of every Lost Lamb event for people who want to turn from sin and turn to Christ by faith. And by the way, when I'm done in the moments ahead, we're going to pray together today. If you've never repented of sin and received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we can punch that ticket today so that you'll not only know who you are, you can know where you're going. But these medical professionals have told me, and the stories vary somewhat in details, but they all come back to a commonality, and the commonality is this. They oftentimes say, I came to faith in Christ, because of watching repeatedly the dramatic difference between death scenarios in the hospital rooms of Christians and people who have no faith. They had seen Christians with family members, and there was peace in the room. And sometimes people were praying. Sometimes they were singing favorite hymns together. When that loved one passed, and left this life and entered into 
their eternal reward. And they said, we've seen the opposite in those who have no faith, that oftentimes there's cussing and profanity and, and worry and anxiety and children fighting over uh, contents of the will before the parent is even deceased and arguments and fistfights in the hallways and the hopelessness and the morbid emptiness of having no idea as to what happens five seconds after you die. You know, as I'm sharing that with you, just days ago, a dear friend of mine, I was preaching in Philadelphia, and while I was there, a dear friend and the entire family, the Farina family in Fairless Hills, Pennsylvania, whom I've known for pretty much my entire ministry, but David Farina, and there's David Farina Sr., he's the elderly pastor of the church there in Fairless Hills, he's in his mid-80s and still pastoring faithfully and serving that congregation. And I have the utmost respect for him and love him dearly. And then he has a son, David Jr., who would be about my age, and recently his mother passed. And in the mother's passing, he was telling me the story as we were having fellowship together. He said, we are so thankful that we had the opportunity of being with mom when she passed. And when she passed away, she was home, and she was in her own bed. And they knew that time was short, and the family was there, and grandchildren were there. Her husband was there, and they were all bedside. And one of Sister Farina's favorite songs, and I knew her. I've met her many, many times through the years. But one of her favorite songs, David told me, was a song that the lyrics state, we are standing on holy ground. Some of you that are listening may have heard that song before. And there's a part of the song where the lyrics say, We are standing on holy ground, and I know that there are angels all around. And as they were singing her favorite song, and they got to those lyrics, and I know that there are angels all around, Sister Farina quietly took her last breath and left this earth peaceably and entered in to the peace and the eternal reward of her Heavenly Father. That's the way you should check out of this life, knowing that you have peace with God, knowing that you're saved, knowing that it is well with your soul. But there obviously are so many who do not have that blessed hope. And before I'm done today, I'm going to walk you through multiple Bible passages. And I want you to refer to them and mark them, memorize some of them, because they'll be so important in settling many of your concerns and doubts. If you do not have peace with God, and you do not know where you'd go five seconds after you die, today I want to show you what the Bible says, and I want to pray with you. As I've already stated, the last thing we'll do in this study, we're not just going to teach you and leave you hanging, we're going to pray together and make peace with God. I know that I'm right with God. I don't say that boastfully, but I know that I'm right with God. I also know that I don't deserve it. I know my many sins are forgiven and forgotten. And I know as I'm speaking to you today, without doubt, I have no doubt. And again, I carefully articulate to you, I am not basing my confidence upon my life or my ministry or my works or my actions, or my deeds, or my accomplishments. I am basing my confidence upon the same things that I'm going to share with you today from the precious Word of God. But I have no doubt that five seconds after I die, if I'm not taken by the rapture, which I believe would probably happen in my lifetime, but if by chance, I live long enough, and the rapture has not yet taken place. I have no doubt that five seconds after I die, 
I will be safely in the eternal arms of my heavenly Father, not because of me, but because of Jesus Christ and the cross and the knowledge that I'm going to share with you today. As I was studying last night and going through the Bible, I thought of an old hymn <clears throat> that they used to sing in church when I was a little boy. And the lyrics go, long ago, long ago. Yes, the old account was settled long ago. And the record's clear today, for he washed my sins away. And the old account was settled long ago. When I lay my head to the pillow at the end of the day, I make sure that my account is settled. Wouldn't you like to lay your head to the pillow tonight and know that all of your sins and all of your account with God is paid in full and Jesus Christ upon the cross paid for my sins and paid for your sins as well. The thing that perhaps is a bit surprising to me is that it's not just sinners who struggle with this question about how can I have an assurance that I have peace with God. More often than not, it's Christians who struggle, even as John wrote that it was Christians he was addressing. They are from people. The questions that come in on the assurance of salvation, they're people that by their own admission, they attend a Bible-believing church. They read their Bible. They pray. They support the work of the Lord. But they still live with this fear and uncertainty concerning their personal salvation. And God doesn't want you to live that way. And as we walk through these verses now, you're going to find that it doesn't have to be that way. I heard one pastor refer to this as spiritual ADD. Assurance Deficit Disorder was his explanation. Spiritual ADD. Assurance Deficit Disorder. And many people suffer with it. Number two, your assurance is built upon the Bible. And this is going to help you today. But if you're wondering where the real foundation is, the real foundation concerning the assurance of salvation, your assurance is built upon the Bible. Write that down. Number two, your assurance is built upon the Bible. The backbone of assurance comes from knowing what the Bible has to say about your salvation. The book makes it sure. It's a simple statement, but it's solid gold in the wisdom of our study today. The book makes us sure. Well, how does it make us sure? Number one, Jesus taught us that you could be sure of your salvation. Under this second point, the first thing I want you to know is that Jesus taught it. Jesus taught us that you could be sure of your salvation. Let's take the time to go through the Bible. Those of you that are new students, you'll oftentimes hear me say, we start in the Bible, we stay in the Bible, we finish in the Bible, and today will be no different. Luke chapter 23, it's in the New Testament if you're a brand new Christian, Matthew, Mark, Luke, the third book in the New Testament, the 23rd chapter, and let's read beginning at verse 39 and read down through verse 33. We're talking about the Bible provides the assurance of your salvation, and the first thing I want you to see in the Bible is that Jesus taught the assurance of salvation. And here's the first passage. Luke chapter 23, verses 39 through 43. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested. Don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? 
We deserve to die for our crimes. But this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. Highlight in your Bible the words of Jesus, I assure you. Jesus offered assurance of salvation. Some have said that this thief was the first one to experience the salvation of the work of the cross. I'll not get into that theological debate today, but I will say this. Jesus clearly told him that he could have an assurance of his salvation. Matthew, Mark, Luke, the next gospel is the gospel of John. And let's go there and let's go to the fifth chapter. John chapter 5 and verse 24. There the Bible says, and by the way, people often ask, what version of the Bible are you reading? And uh, most of the time, not always, but most of the time, I'm studying and reading to you out of the New Living Translation. It's a trustworthy, modern translation. Uh, I receive uh, concern by some that would consider themselves King James Version only. And I love the King James Version. As you've heard me say, my target audience is unsaved, unchurched, unreached people. And the King James Version was written in 18th century Elizabethan English, which we no longer speak. Uh, I'll always be sure to bring an accurate translation of whatever scriptures I'm teaching you. But I want to do it in language that the average 21st century human being speaks and understands. John 5 and 24, the Bible says, I tell you the truth. Or if you have a King James Version, and some of our students and followers do exclusively, I believe in the King James Version, it says, most assuredly, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death into life. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. There's no wavering in this, in other words. Jesus said, most assuredly, those, and listen to the evolution, those who listen to my message, that's what you're doing right now, and believe in God, that's number two, who sent me, that's Jesus, have eternal life. Salvation begins by listening to the Bible. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Ephesians 2, chapter 2 and verse 8, For by grace are we saved through faith. Faith begins in listening to the message that was given to us in the Scriptures and believe that God sent His only Son, Jesus. Jesus said, Those who listen to my message, believe in God who sent me, have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but have already passed from death unto life. And notice once again that Jesus is addressing those who have believed the message, received Christ as Lord and Savior, but apparently Christians still have faults and failures and can transgress. I'll return to that. Let's move on. Not only did Jesus believe in the assurance of salvation, but the Apostle Paul, whom God used to write over one-third of your New Testament. The Apostle Paul strongly believed that we could have the assurance of our salvation. Uh, go to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians and the first chapter and go down to verse 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 5, 
Paul wrote to that infant church in Thessalonica and said this, For when we brought you the good news, it was not only with words, but also with power. For the Holy Spirit gave you full assurance that what we said was true. And you know of our concern for you from the way we lived when we were with you. Highlight for the Holy Spirit gave you full assurance. The Holy Spirit will give you a witness and a full assurance of your salvation. Paul wrote to his young protege in the ministry whose name was Timothy. And let's go over to 2 Timothy and the first chapter. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. Paul wrote to Timothy and said, That is why I am suffering here in prison. He wrote this letter to Timothy while he was imprisoned. He went on to say, But I am not ashamed of it, for I know the one in whom I trust, and I am sure that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until the day of his return. Highlight in verse 12 where Paul said, For I know. And then highlight where Paul said, I am sure. Praise God. Paul, the great apostle, was not wrestling in any way with the assurance of his salvation. Though he was in prison, though he had been falsely accused, though he was being persecuted, though he was going through a difficult time, difficult times did not rob him of his confidence and his assurance. He said, I am sure. And that's how solid God wants you to be in your salvation. If I were to ask you, are you a real Christian and are you sure, what would your response be? I want you to think about that just for a moment and don't take yourself down the lane of guilt trip in the process, but just think about that sobering question. If I were to ask you the question, are you a real Christian and are you sure, what would your answer be? Some of you would probably say, well, I sure hope so. Some of you might say, well, I think so. But this preacher loves you enough that I cannot leave you with an I hope so or and I think so down deep in your heart. Just as Jesus taught, just as the apostle Paul taught, I want you to have I know so with every doubt and every concern buried beneath the Bible. If you're taking notes, number three, your assurance is built upon true salvation. In the second part of this study, point two, I taught you that your assurance is built upon the Bible. Number three, your assurance is built upon true salvation. This is very important. Pay careful attention. Because if you do not biblically understand what true salvation is, you're never going to have the assurance of your salvation. And quite honestly, I believe this probably would be at the top of the list as to why people have doubts and concerns about their salvation. If I were to ask the average person without any resources, without any Bible, but just handed them a, a single piece of paper and asked them to write me a simple 100-word essay on what is true salvation, I have a feeling that there would be answers all over the map and not all of which would be biblically correct. And so let's take the time in this study to address what is true salvation. The Bible condemns self-doubt, but the Bible requires self-examination. Very important. Write it down. The Bible condemns 
self-doubt, but the Bible requires self-examination. Very, very important. Uh, I can hear some of you perhaps in your mind saying, well, where in the Bible does it say that? And uh, all of my long-term students know that I'm surely not going to stay anything of, of that uh, magnitude without taking you into the Bible. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians and the 13th chapter and go down to verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 5. Examine yourselves. Highlight that. Examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. Once again, written by the Apostle Paul. This is the second letter to the church at Corinth. And he said in the very last chapter of 2 Corinthians, he's closing this letter with his important final remarks, his last letter to this church. And in the last part of the letter, what did he say? By the way, before we wrap this up, remember this. As a believer, you need to examine yourself to see if your faith is really genuine. Why would he say that? Because there are counterfeit Christians who go to church. There are counterfeit Christians who make claims of being followers of Christ, but they've never experienced true salvation. And as a result, these people confuse those who are sincere. And some of you are in that position. You're very sincere in trying to learn the Bible, in trying to live a life that's pleasing in the eyes of God, in developing your faith, in growing in Christ. But sadly, some of you have got some people in your life that are counterfeit Christians and their hypocrisy has left you with confusion. And it's the reason why many people don't have assurance. Somebody wrote me just recently and said they started attending the church. And on the very first Sunday that they were there, the pastor got up and preached a message on grace. And in his message on grace, he said, and this is almost a direct quote from the email, the pastor said, it doesn't matter how you live. It doesn't matter if you live just the same way you lived before you came to Christ. The grace of God covers all sin just as long as you believe in Jesus. As long as you believe in Jesus, it doesn't matter how you live. And many people are teaching this today. But it does matter how you live. And when somebody tells you that the grace of God covers all of your sins, past, present, and future, then you know you're listening to a heretic. Because the Apostle Paul said, as believers, should we continue in sin so that grace may abound? God forbid. That's what Paul said. Here's what I'll say. Any teaching on grace that makes you feel comfortable with willing sin is heresy. Any teaching on grace that makes you feel comfortable with sin is heresy. There is a difference. And Paul said to believers, examine yourself to see if your faith is really genuine. It does matter how you live. And I can tell you right now, when the rapture takes place, that pastor will still be at his church, standing at his pulpit. And he'll be left behind because he doesn't know the scriptures and is leading people astray. And the Bible said, woe unto any who teach in such a manner that it puts a millstone around the necks of young believers and causes them to be destroyed in faith. It would be better for the false teacher to have the same outcome. A millstone put around his neck and thrown into the sea. The last days will be rife with false prophets and false teachers. God wouldn't have said, be ye holy, even as I am holy, if he didn't say what he mean and meant what he said. We're going to get to that in just a moment and deal with it in a greater way. 
Many people struggle with the assurance of their salvation because of false teaching, as I've just mentioned, or the absence of teaching. But listen to what I'm about to say, because I am going to talk about your behavior and your conduct as an evidence or a proof of your salvation. As Paul said, examine yourself to see if your faith is really genuine. But let me help you with something. You will never be saved by your works. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian. Reading a Bible doesn't make you a Christian. Praying doesn't make you a Christian. Supporting the work of God generously does not make you a Christian. Singing Christian songs does not make you a Christian. Being moral and decent does not make you a Christian. You are never saved by your own works, but there will be works when you are truly saved. Let me say that again. We are never saved by our own works, but when you have experienced true salvation, there will be works that can be examined. Let me be very specific. If you're taking notes, what is true salvation? That deserves a concise answer. What is true salvation? If it matters so much, what is true salvation? The Bible teaches us that all of us have sinned and our sin separates us from the holiness of God. Let's, let's go to the Bible here because there are some important passages yet as we're winding this down that I want you to see. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, go to verse 22, and I'm going to read through verse 26. Romans chapter 3, 22 through 26. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, with undeserved kindness, declares that we are righteous. He did this through Christ Jesus when He freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed His life, shedding His blood. Let me pause right there. Highlight that in your Bible. Solid gold nugget right there. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed His life, shedding His blood. Let's read on. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when He held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For He was looking ahead and including them in what He would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate His righteousness, for He Himself is fair and just, and He declares sinners to be right in His sight when they believe in Jesus. Let me emphasize that again, because we're talking about what is true salvation. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed His life, shedding His blood. You remember in our second point, when I told you that the Bible provides us with the assurance of our salvation, and I told you the book makes us sure. Well, here we learn the blood makes us safe. The only way to experience true salvation is you must put your faith in the work of the cross. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You put your faith in the cross, not your own work, not your own efforts, not your own goodness, not your own morality, not your own accomplishments. You put your faith in Jesus Christ and in the work of the cross and His shed blood. The Bible says that by the blood of Jesus, He forgives our sins and cleanses us. 
So the book makes us sure, but the blood makes us safe. We can never be made right, right with God except through faith in Christ alone. Upon the cross, Jesus, when he died, and by the way, he not only died, but he rose again. And he said, I'm coming again. 400 times in the New Testament, we were promised that Jesus will return. That's why it's so important to examine yourself and to be sure you have true salvation. Jesus paid a debt he did not owe, and I owed a debt I could not pay. Let's go over to the book of Romans in the 10th chapter. Romans chapter 10. And go to verse 9, and let's read down through verse 13. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13. Again, written by the Apostle Paul. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it is by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. As the scriptures tell us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Take your highlighter in your Bible, Romans chapter 10, highlight verse 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We're showing you things in the Bible that support what true salvation really is. Notice that the Bible did not say you may be saved or some will be saved or there's a pretty good chance that you'll be saved. It says all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You will be saved. No doubt, no question mark, with true salvation. Let's go into the Gospel of John. Just back up a little bit here in the New Testament to the Gospel of John. And the fifth chapter, John chapter 5, and look at verse 24. There the Bible says, I tell you the truth, those who listen to my message and believe in God who sent me have eternal life. They will never be condemned for their sins, but they have already passed from death into life. Those who listen to my message, believe in God, believe God sent Jesus, they have eternal life eternal life. Uh, a well-known uh, modern theologian by the name of Dr. David Jeremiah, he said this, quote, if someone were to ask you how you know you're a Christian, you can answer it in one of two ways. If your answer begins with, because I, and proceeds to outline all that you did to become a Christian, then you have not been born again. But if your answer begins with because He, meaning Christ, and then you go on to describe all that Jesus has done for you, you have evidenced the first birthmark of a believer. End quote. That's excellent. If you begin with because I and proceed to outline all you have done, then you probably don't have a true salvation. But if someone asks you how you know you're a Christian and it begins with because He, meaning Christ, and you explain to them that Christ is the one who purchased salvation, paid the penalty for all sin, then that is evidence of true salvation. Lastly, and I close with this, your assurance is built upon a changed life. And many don't understand how important this is. Notice that you've never heard me ever 
I don't care if you've listened to me for all 40 years of my ministry plus. You have never heard from my mouth that it's easy to be a Christian. And I'm not saying that today. Jesus said, will I even find faith when I return on the earth? Jesus said, the road that leads to heaven is straight and narrow. Matthew chapter 7, verse 14. But the road to hell or to destruction is wide and broad, and many there go in thereby. It's not easy being a Christian. It's just always worth it. It's always easy to do the wrong thing, and it's always harder to do the right thing. I'm never going to tell you that it's easy to be a Christian, but I am going to tell you that the Bible says when you receive Christ, God will give you the power. As many as receive Christ, He gives to them the power to become the sons and the daughters of God. When you truly receive salvation, God gives you the help of the Holy Spirit and the power of His eternal Word and the support of the Holy Church and you will survive and thrive and excel for the glory of God all the days of your life if you build your faith upon true salvation. I saw a prayer on social media, and I wanted to share it with you today in this teaching. The prayer goes like this, quote, Dear Lord, so far today I'm doing all right. I have not gossiped, lost my temper, been greedy, grumpy, nasty, selfish, or self-indulgent. I have not whined, complained, cursed, or eaten any chocolate. I have charged nothing on my credit card. But Lord, I'll be getting out of bed in a minute, and I'm really going to need your help. Sad that's true for many Christians. But what was the Apostle Paul's attitude? Uh, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and go down to verses 14 through 17. Listen carefully to Paul's attitude. He said, either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old self. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means, and highlight this, Verse 17, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. When you have a true salvation experience in your life, your lifestyle will change. I'm going to say it again. When you have a true salvation experience in your life, your lifestyle will change. As you begin to grow in your faith, in true salvation, your desires will change, your conduct will change, you'll notice a change in your language, in your thought life, and even in your priorities. The Bible teaches, don't miss this, the Bible teaches us that when you experience true salvation, your beliefs will be backed up by your behaviors. Write that down. Your beliefs will be backed up by your behavior when you experience true salvation. Let's go to 1 John because some of you are saying, I'm not sure if I believe that. Well, I never teach you anything that's not straight out of the pages of the Bible. And uh, so let's go to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 6. 1 John chapter 3, verses 6 through 10. Anyone who continues to live in him will not sin. But anyone who keeps on sinning does not know him or understand who he is. Dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. Highlight that. 
Don't let anyone deceive you about this in the 21st century. And I am telling you right now that there are far more who preach the deception than pe preach the truth. Sadly, almost the majority, and I hope I'm not being too judgmental, but I love you enough to warn you. The majority of what I hear on social media is not true salvation. This is straight out of the pages of the Bible. Anybody that tells you that you can continue to sin and God doesn't hold you accountable isn't preaching true salvation. Now don't get beat up. I'm going to help you here in just a moment with understanding the difference between willing sin and dealing with the struggles of the flesh. Anyone who keeps on sinning, verse 6, does not know him or understand who he is. Verse 7, dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it shows that they are righteous even as Christ is righteous. Verse 8, but when people keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to the devil who has been sinning since the beginning. But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. Verse 9, those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning. Because God's life is in them, so they can't keep on sinning because they are children of God. So now we can tell who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Any preacher that tells you that you can keep on living the way you have already been living, that there's no difference because the grace of God covers everything, doesn't know their Bible. The Bible said you can clearly tell the children of God from the children of the devil. The children of the devil keep on sinning. The children of God are in pursuit of holiness and righteousness and purity. Let's read on. Anyone who does not live righteously and does not love other believers does not belong to God. Now I'll be the first one to admit that these words in the Bible are harsh. But only harsh for those who are looking for a license to continue in sin. But they don't understand that sin is a curse. And God doesn't want you to live under the curse of sin. He wants you to live under the blessing of God. So when you clean house and get rid of sin, you're making room for the greater blessing of God to come and fill that void. Write this down because some of you need some help there. I don't want you to leave with judgment on this. I want you to understand truth no matter how hard it might be. But I want you to understand truth in context, and here's the context. There is a world of difference between those who willingly practice sin and the believer who struggles with their frailties of flesh and on an occasion they sin or on a rarer and rarer occasion as your faith becomes stronger. But as long as you live in a body of flesh, you're going to have frailties. But it should never become a license for a lifestyle of sin. So in your notes, make sure that you understand the Bible differentiates between those who willingly practice sin. Let me give you an example. You go to church. The preacher preaches a message on salvation. He preaches true salvation. He gives an altar call. You go forward. You pray the sinner's prayer. You give your heart to Jesus. But you're living in adultery. If you walk out of church and just say, well, I'm saved now. It doesn't matter how I live. You continue to live in adultery. You continue to go to wild parties. You continue to get drunk. You continue to take the name of the Lord in vain. You continue to run a dishonest business. You continue to rip off the insurance company. You continue to rip off the government and its benefits. You continue to willingly practice sin, then you didn't experience a true salvation. I had individuals that were living in sin in our last Lost Lamb event. And these two ladies who were living in sin, living in a lesbian relationship, came forward and both gave their hearts to Christ. At the end of the service, and I'm not condemning lesbians. It's not the only sin. Homosexuality. There's all kinds of sexual sins 
in the Bible. But God can save anyone who repents of sin. I'm just giving you an illustration. But one turned to the other in the hall. They had been invited by a friend. A friend was with them. And one turned to the other and said, you do realize that we can no longer live together and continue this lifestyle. That's true salvation. I didn't preach on sexual sin that day. I didn't come anywhere near the zip code of sexual sins in my message that day. But God, by the Holy Spirit, writes His law in our heart. And when you have true salvation, the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. Pay attention to His conviction. Pay attention to His warning. Pay attention to His flashing yellow lights and His flashing red lights that warn you of wrong decisions and wrong turns that will produce bad outcomes. In the Christian life, we fight three main enemies. And the three main enemies in the Bible are the world, the flesh, and the devil. Well, where do we find that? Turn to 1 John chapter 2. As we come to the conclusion of this message, I'm going to leave you with a word of encouragement. Thank you for your patience in finding help in the Word of God today. 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17. Do not love this world nor the things it offers you, for when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you, for the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. The true Christian is always in a war with the world your flesh, and the devil. And no matter how saved you are, and no matter how long you've been saved, you will always be in a war with the world, with the flesh, and with the devil. Somebody asked me in one of the questions, well, what if we sin? What if I slip? What if profanity comes out of my mouth? And I didn't mean it, but I've just been so much of a foul-languaged individual my whole life. It just comes out sometimes when I'm angry without thinking. Well, there's a difference, as I've said and reiterate, there's a difference between willing, practice sin, and as you're growing in your faith, you're weeding through the process of conversion. Because, listen carefully, don't miss this. This is really, really important. At the moment of true salvation, you are sanctified. The Bible gives us that word. You are sanctified. What does that mean? It means that you are washed clean of all of your sin, all of your past, all forgiven, all forgotten. It's called in the world of theology, instantaneous sanctification. At the moment of true conversion, you are instantaneously sanctified, cleansed. Purified in that moment, pure, holy in the eyes of God. But sanctification is not only instantaneous, it is also progressive. I may take a bath today and be absolutely pure and clean when I'm done. But if I don't take a bath for a year, my bath today is not going to be of any value a year from now. I must continue to live clean. I must continue to avoid filth. I must continue to avoid things that would make me unclean. That's progressive sanctification. You are made pure in the eyes of God on the day of your salvation, but you continue to progress. That's why you pray. When Jesus taught us to pray, he said, forgive us of our temptations. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. He was giving a prayer to believers. We face three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, I close with this. 1 John 1, verse 8, If we claim we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. 
This will help some of you that say, well, you know, I can't ever be a Christian life because I, I sin. I, I went one time for 16 days and didn't sin that I know of. And then on the 17th day I sinned, therefore I'm not a real Christian. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. There is a world of difference between willingly practicing sin and in the battle with the world, the flesh, and the devil, on occasions your frailties let you down. That's why the Bible, the word sin, the original word sin is from the Greek hermasia, H-A-R-M-A-T-I-A, hermasia. And what it means is missing the mark. Like a child that you're teaching to shoot a bow and arrow who's trying to hit the target, but their arrow falls short. Some of you are trying to live for God, but on occasions your arrows don't hit the target. What do you do if you're a true believer and you sin? The Bible says you run quickly to God and you repent. Repentance isn't something you do once in your life. You should be mindful of living clean and holy every day of your life. Let me read on. 1 John uh, chapter 1, verse 8, if we claim we have no sin, now notice he's writing to Christians. He's saying, Christian, if you claim you have no sin, you're only fooling yourself and not living in the truth. Verse 9, but if we confess our sins to him, here it is, highlight it, verse 9, if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all wickedness or unrighteousness. Verse 10, if we claim we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our hearts. Chapter 2, verse 1, my dear children, I am writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate. Praise God. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. Jesus Christ is your advocate. Make sure that you've received true salvation. And true beliefs will give you a changed behavior. And the Holy Spirit will help you. And you progress Every successful Christian reads their Bible every day. Every successful Christian prays every day. Every successful Christian finds a Bible-believing church with a godly pastor and faithfully attends at least once a week. And every successful Christian is praying for friends and family to be saved. If you'll focus on these things, you will never fail and you'll never fall. And the Lord will help you. And from this day forward, may you have the assurance of your salvation. Before we go, I'd like to pray for you because I'm sure there are some of you who need to come to Christ. There are some of you perhaps who have been sitting under false teaching and maybe you've been listening to a teaching that's become so prevalent in these last days on grace that basically says all sins past, present, and future are already forgiven. There's only one sin in the Bible that God can forgive. And that's sin that's been confessed and repented of. If we confess our sins, if, that's a big if, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Will you pray with me today? Some of you are receiving Christ for the first time. Some of you once knew the Lord, but you've bought the bait of apostate teaching and teachers. And you've wandered away and taken grace as a license to live. Some of you have been entrapped in all of the sensuality that the world flaunts before us on a regular basis. And today you're coming home wherever you might be. Pray with me right now. Today you can receive true salvation and have an assurance that will last you all the days of your life. Pray this with me. Say, Heavenly Father, today as I was listening to the Bible, you were speaking to me. I sincerely desire 
to receive true salvation. And I understand that sin separates us from a holy God. Today I acknowledge all my sin. And in childlike faith I repent. I turn my back on sin and I turn my heart to Jesus. I trust in Jesus alone. I trust in the cross and in the blood that was shed that paid the penalty for my sin. He took the judgment and the wrath of God upon himself. And all who trust in Christ will be saved. I receive Jesus Christ today as Lord and as Savior. I believe that he's God's son. That you sent him so that I might know Christ and have peace with God. I receive salvation now and am no longer under the curse of sin. I today am a child of God and I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you. 